Hi, Margaret. Hi, Levi. Thanks for joining me today. Um, today we are talking about World AIDS Day and um, kind of the importance of that and why it might be relevant to Sunshine House because I feel like Sunshine House has changed a lot in the last uh, couple of years. And I think it's also really important that we recognize our history and kind of what shapes and what has been important in making Sunshine House what it is. And one of those was your role and a lot of other people's role in responding to and um, navigating uh, the HIV AIDS epidemic in the 90s and the 80s and the early 2000s. And so I figured what better, what other better person to talk to than you to kind of talk about the importance of AIDS, World AIDS Day and Sunshine House. You know, you know, one of my failings, I have many, but one of them is just wandering around um, in history um, gets to be a problem because things get all kind of mixed up. You said that things have changed in the past couple of years. What does that mean? Hey, I'm not on trial here. I, I didn't ask <laughs> you. I just, want you on trial. I just want to know. Well, you and I have very different approaches to how things, how we do things. You have a lot more skill in, um, in some things that I don't have as much skills. So that also means that just using what we got here is much different now than it was three years ago. Yeah, but I think there's a real strong common thread. I think there's really strong um, uh, sense of, um, not obligation, that's the wrong word, but responsibility, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a really strong uh, sense of humor that I think is the driving force of what um, Sunshine House has come to mean for a lot of people. It's a place where they can make fun of things and say terrible things and it's just fine. And so where does that come from? Because that doesn't just, that's not a thing because I've been around for a while now and yeah. you've been around for longer. And that's not a thing that's part of every other organization for a lot of reasons, many good, many yeah. different. Um, yeah. So where, where does that, where does that kind of approach come from? Because your ability to do that and infuse those things into work has you're right it still maintains and it's and then everything that we continue to do here or new programs or whatever um we still stay very very true to that because we have to understand like sunshine house there's a reason we exist in the way that we exist but right. a lot of people don't re, a lot of people don't understand why right i i don't think it's a really an abstraction i think people are welcome there exactly how they are and exactly who they are with no need to explain themselves or, or no need to modify what they do or who they are. They come as they are. And I think that's very unusual. I, I, I don't think people are ha have to get cleaned up to go. I think they are what they are. And that's a very unusual, that's a very unusual trait. I think you've maintained maintained that. So the history, like where where did it come from? Well, the whole the whole time of HIV, right from the very beginning, was a time of kind of real anxiety and real panic for people, and they didn't know what it meant. They didn't know what things meant. They didn't know where to go. They didn't know who to talk to. Um, they didn't know where th to tell their story, um, and so it became a, a sort of venue for telling people's, telling people's stories and being open enough to receive information, to get information back. Yeah, I, I think that's what made it um, unusual. You know, organizations like Kali Shiva um, and the Village Clinic back long back in the day um, were instrumental in all of that. Like they were instrumental in um, helping people find what they needed in a way that worked. So what did that look like? Like, what is, is it the same now 
as as it was then because i imagine like when did you start and what was the current like the encouragement was way 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 different so like yeah what did that look like for you folks when i came well i came to village clinic from power which was is now sage house which was then prostitutes and other women for equal rights i was the medical coordinator then and it was just at the sort of beginning not not really the beginning but hiv had had emerged i hate this language but you know what i'm talking about in the gay population uh, among gay men and young men were coming back to winnipeg from wherever they were sick and um well dying really um and th that was the sort of genesis for kali shiva to to emerge um a, a woman named bev suik um whose son came home very ill um set up a um, volunteer system where people like her son could get home care could get care from volunteers it went on for like 10 years as a volunteer organization. Village Clinic emerged, came up um, as the sort of medical facility for that, but it was without with, entirely without money. Like the, the, there was no funding for it at all. So young men mostly then, not entirely, but mostly young men came to get medical care when there was very, very little. Like there were no medications, there was, uh, a terrible sense of anxiety, kind of doom. And it was, it was, you know, people were, you know, the, the, the timeline was very short, you know, people were dying, people were committing suicide. It was a very, very dark time. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I, there was a lot going on. There were lots of people with lots of questions. It was very difficult to ask the questions because people didn't really know what they were. Um, all they knew was that this was something to be worried about and afraid of and hide and hide from. So when you're talking about people who are worried about and afraid of this stuff, like, was this people, was this everybody? Was it part of just one subsect of people? Because I know, like, what, what, what year are we talking? Like, what years are we talking about so that people get a better understanding? Because, like, this is, I think... I know for me, um, I came out much l later than this. HIV AIDS didn't have the same impact on my coming out experience as it did for someone who may have, would have come out five to 10 years before me. Yeah, well, I was around in the five to 10 years before before you. Come on now, so, no, you, you, before, before that even. <laughs> oh, well, okay, oh, okay. Yeah, but it was, it was a long time and you know, who was around. I mean, when I went to Village Clinic, that would be have been in the late 90s, trying to remember. But yeah, the late 90s. Um, and who was there? Who were the, it was mostly gay men then. There were beginning, there was a, a be beginning of um, a new wave of people, people that use drugs, um, you know, women, um, many indigenous people that were coming there. And it was, you know, it, was, it wasn't a conflict. It was just friction because the, the organization was so protected because it had so little resources that, you know, sharing those resources, broadening out the resources was very, very difficult. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, people were generous. You know, Kali Shiva was extremely generous. Um, Village Clinic was really generous. Um, the AIDS Shelter Coalition that existed then um, and ended up in Artemis Housing, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, um, Indigenous organization that, that looked after Indigenous people with HIV, you know, these organizations were all struggling and then came together or tried to come together under nine circles um, in those early years, tried to um, integrate or amalgamate in those early years, but it was difficult, very difficult. At that point, 
Kali Shiva removed itself from the integration process because they were worried about the ideas of prevention. They were worried about care of women. They were worried about care of indigenous people and afraid that that would not be met in that in the model that was being developed. So removed removed uh, itself as an organization and integrated entirely into Sunshine House. Hmm. So clarify a few things for me. So you said that you said this was the late nineties. So what was yep. happening? What was happening in the in the eighties? to lead up, because we often say that we have 30 years of experience working with the community at Sunshine House. Yeah. So my math is not that bad. I know that now to the late 90s is not 30 years. What was happening in that lead up, in those that decade leading up to that? What was happening in, in general? Yeah, in general and just in the formation of the Sunshine House. Okay, so, so I think just in general, there were those core organizations like uh, village clinic, um, a shelter coalition. The, those organizations were doing everything that they could to support people with HIV. But the the idea of prevention, the idea of you know mitigating the situation or getting people information was it was very difficult to do um, because they didn't we didn't know where people were or what their situation was. So you know there was there was outreach that was going on that it was very different from the outreach now people were sort of wandering around the riverbanks wanting to talk to people um and needing to get people information and making sure people understood about condoms and all that stuff that nobody was people were interested and it they needed stuff but it wasn't I don't know how to explain it. It was a time of tremendous confusion. Um, and the information that was coming from, you know, uh, from other, or, um, from federal government, from international, the international scene was very confusing. You had, you know, the Reagan administration who refused to even talk about um, HIV. It was a just say no to drugs stuff, which even those days was hilarious. I mean, it was this kind of Hollywood picture that wasn't what people saw and wasn't what people experienced at all. So you had this, this, you know, a very, very difficult time. There were people around really, you know, really smart people who were saying things and were trying to explain things and show people uh, how to do prevention work you know, there was no needle exchange. There was no, you know, people were using Talwin and Ritalin in those days. There was no um, movement to make things safer for people. So people were getting HIV. I, I, I remember Dion Sunshine for one, I, I, you know, and it was like, well, there we are. <laughs> there, well, there we are, you know, now I'm cooked. And that was the sort of general attitude. It was, very, it was a very, very hard time. People rose to it with great compassion and great good humor um, and took care of each other, like really, really took care of each other, which was, you know, made the sort of medical community, they didn't know what to do. And it was left to the community. It was left to people in the community to take care of each other, and they did. Yeah, I... I, I know I'm wandering around, I'm sorry, but but it was a very, very hard time. It was a very co complicated time. No, I don't think you're wandering around. And I think that is important for us to, to emphasize how chaotic it was. So I wanna I wanna go back to what you what you said about the medical community didn't know what they didn't know how to respond so we like so you've you mentioned that political people weren't even talking about it weren't doing anything but what what kind of things do you think we learned in these different types of institutions from that original experience from that ex from from that decade or two of absolute chaos what do you, what do you, what positives or what negatives do you see out of out of that 
Well, I think there were people like, I think about Dick Smith, for example, you know, who invested his entire career, his entire medical career into um, caring for people, you know, caring for doing medical care for people who um, were living with HIV then. Um, I think people like Dick worked tirelessly to, to kind of hone their skills and and figure out what was going on and figure out how to treat people. The medications that were available then were useless. I mean, there was the Concord study that showed that AZT, which is the only drug that was available then, was just about useless. You know, it worked for a very short period of time and then it didn't work anymore. And there was nothing. There were you know, a, a, f a few other drugs that were kind of around that people were begging to get. Um, but but people knew that they were, they weren't helpful at all. What they had was not very much. And what they had was a kind of curiosity and a, a sense of inquiry into what would make things better and how to treat people better. That was really quite remarkable. There were, there were physicians that came to Village Clinic in those days. It was before it was Nine Circles. You know, Carol Weeb. These were young, young doctors who, who came with, a, with a, a real sense of inquiry and compassion and just worked tirelessly to make things better for people. They were, they were remarkable. I know that doesn't answer your question. No, it's I'm fine. Not no, going I to I don't I don't care there's no real answer to these things it's no. it's just important to get like an understanding of what of what things look like because this is I know as a queer person we talk about the HIV AIDS epidemic and about like as an integral part of our collective memory but we don't actually know a lot of times we don't we aren't confronted with the reality of what it looked like mm -hmm. um beyond you know the, uh, the odd hollywood depiction of it yeah um, yeah and and that's true that's exactly what it was the odd hollywood the what was the name of that the philadelphia and the the movies you know they were all so very compassionate and all so very sad but the reality here was every bit as as dark as that was I remember the first time doing Icarus. You, you, do you know what Icarus is? Do you know what Icarus was? No idea. Okay. Well, it was a skydiving mania, maniacs, you know, decided it was John Schellenberg and I that talked about doing this skydiving thing to raise money for, for, to, to help to care for people with, with HIV. Um, it was craziness. The first time they did it in Gimli, no, both times. Um, and people signed up to do this skydiving with craziness. Everybody, it was craziness. Everybody there, I remember the plane taking off and people in the plane, they were going to jump out of that plane. <laughs> it, it, and people on the ground were weeping. Like, it was, a, it was really, it was really funny and really serious and really sad. And I think that's what characterizes a lot of that time. There were so many things happening at the same time. People were raucous and silly and funny and brave and all that, but they were so sad at the same time. So now, I mean, now, you know, HIV is treated as a chronic medical condition and that's that's good i'm not faulting that at all people are living well they're living you know full productive lives but the early stuff was very troubled and very very sad well and it came at at such a such a huge cost too like oh there was, yeah there's yeah. no there's no yeah, there's there was no will to do anything no. at, at, a, at, a, at a large scale level, and from what I understand, until until much until we started seeing more straight white people contracting the illness. Yeah, maybe, maybe though it was you know uh, 
you know, young white gay guys at the, at the beginning who were uh, who were affected. And and but I mean, that didn't last at all. That did, that wasn't the story at all. Um, when it started to impact indigenous people and women and the whole thing changed, like things really changed. I remember on Main Street tearing down the Patricia Hotel and the Savoy and these places that were kind of not institutions, but they were the the, the where people went. You know, the, it was the home for a lot of people, and and the, you know the city just tore them down, like tore those hotels down because they symbolized. I don't know. It wasn't that dramatic. I mean, they were eyesores and they were all kinds of other things, but but they were the they were the kind of symbol of the resiliency of people. Um, and it was, they were just torn down you know, they were just demolished. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Is there any kind of parallels in, in the way that public and governments and agencies and different places have reacted to the COVID-19 pandemic to the HIV AIDS pandemic? What, what, what are there any parallels? Is there anything that we learned collectively from that early experience, from that experience that it's not an early experience because human beings always deal with pandemics, but was there anything that you see that was, that kind of made you think about those times or that, you know, I don't know. What do, yeah, what do you well, you know, that's that sense of, uh, it's kind of, it's not funny, but the sense of control, the sense of, taking risks, we have to take responsibility, we have to step up for this. I, I, it makes me, doesn't make me laugh. I think, wait a minute, people are living with this. They're living in this environment right now. So telling people that they have to, you know, go home and not go out and not go shopping and not do this is all fine. So I get it. I get it. But it's that sense of kind of, righteous indignation that people are not doing what they're supposed to do. I think, yes, they are. They're doing what they can do. They're doing what they can do. The fact that there's not rapid testing, the fact that there's not rapid contact tracing is, I, I think, a hallmark of this situation now. It's, it's a, it, it really is a hallmark. And people that are homeless or don't have any place to go it's all fine to tell people to go home well what if you don't have one you know what if you don't have a home what if you don't have a place to go to i think those kind of broad political statements miss the mark terribly with people that are um in real serious serious need you must see it every day there mm -hmm. yeah and what do people say? Well, people people say what they always say. So people's survival. Yep. People's survival is determined on, by a number of different decisions on a daily basis. And so people are really, really good and really, really intelligent. And they're well-versed in the risks and the harms of existing in this place at yep. any given time. So if you yeah. add an extra layer to that, it just makes decisions a little bit more complicated. But people, you're right. People still have to do what they have to do in order to survive. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the times that's not congruent with messaging. That's not yeah. congruent with my own desires as a fairly stable, income secure person. Um, but I also like there's there's just a number of different things that we have to take into consideration when when we're passing judgment or determining what what's for the greater good. Yep. And yep. you're right. I think a lot of this righteousness, often consciously or unconsciously. Uh, overlooks a lot of the the people who live their lives in the gray areas or the margins of a society or a city that we've just forcefully constructed, not taking recognition of the very real historical, political, 
and social divides that exist within this community. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really the case. <laughs> and I think ignoring, one of the things that's ignored in that is people's will, willingness um, to uh, assist, to help each other. And that that's their life. That's not that's not something that you do once in a while. That's something that happens for people every single day. Yeah. Every day. That yeah. people are doing that and they're doing it with humor. It might it might be bratty, it might be real bratty, but they're still doing it. Yeah. 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 I think that is also a really key component that's missed out on a lot of these discussions is that these survival mechanisms are gonna exist and were developed long before COVID and were created out of a response to dealing with much different long-term processes. Like, yeah. but so we also have to recognize that there's, an, there's a great, great need for cooperation and collaboration between the folks that we work with in order to survive. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and I think that that sense of cooperation and that sense of assisting has, you know, centuries of history. Mm -hmm. This isn't new. This yeah. is, these are old things, and and thinking that we need a new system, we need a new. Wait a minute. I think we need to look at what happened and what people have done and learn from it and learn really mm -hmm. well from it. Yep. I guess we should get back to the theme at hand because we're going to go way off the rails. Um, I, know. I know. But why, I guess, linking back to everything that we've kind of talked about, why do you think it's important that we continue to recognize World AIDS Day? And what do you say to people like me who aren't as deeply impacted by HIV AIDS in the same way other folks are, who often treat it as an abstract concept. What, HIV as an abstract concept? HIV AIDS, yeah. Yeah. It's a, thing, it's a historical thing or it's a thing that happens out there, not, we don't, we talk about things like treatment and we talk about PrEP and we talk about all of these advances in like poss possible vaccinations and all these other things as, but we don't actually, we still don't, I, I, I'm often guilty of this, of not fully understanding the pervasiveness and the reality of HIV AIDS historically and in a con contemporary sense. So why is it important that we celebrate thinking all of those things or talk about it? Well, because I think there are still people, people around now that were around then who lived through that time, who lived in, uh, you know, a um, really, really difficult time, who have, who are graceful in their, you know, in their world. They're graceful in their approach to to living. I think about people like Dion Sunshine, who's you know, letter, he wrote this letter and, and it urged people to take care of each other. Um, he, it was a, it was kind of urgent that people take care of each other. Uh, you know, I think about so many people and that's why this time is not difficult for me, but I think about all these people that I knew who tried, tried to navigate that time with in in a way that made sense for them i mean i i think about the people that i know and the thing about the people that are still around and how graceful they are and you know that they carry this history and it's uh, well they're not burdened by it but it's a it's a responsibility to show people what happened and who they were and and what really happened um this is you know young people who are getting getting diagnosed with HIV now, young women and indigenous people who, I, I think, oh God, how is this, how is this possible that people are not doing the prevention work, that people are not doing it? They're not talking about it. It's, 
you know, the, the, the issue with syphilis now and the hundreds of cases of syphilis in, in Manitoba and, the, and contact tracing is not being done. Well, you know, contact tracing is not being done for COVID. And you think, well, why not? Like, what seems to be the problem? <laughs> What's the problem here? You know, I, and it, for me, it's something that I don't understand. I, I just don't understand it. You know, people are very serious and they're having heartfelt conversations. I think, wait a minute, just do contact tracing. Just go, go on out the door and do contact tracing. Well, it's too hard and it's too complicated and it causes too much friction. I think, no, no, it doesn't. No, there's a way to do this. Sorry. That's, I'm not I'm not no. You're not sorry. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm, you're, I'm you're not right. sorry. No. I, uh, well, no, I, I really appreciate the way that you talk about all of the positives uh, about the community care and the things that we can learn from those who lived and continue to live through yeah. caring for people with HIV or AIDS. I think that that's, I think that's crucial and it's stuff that I constantly need to hear. And I just want to say thanks for sh for sharing that. Um, also, I don't know. It, it, I'll leave here with a lot of with a lot of thoughts, but I won't bother you with them. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, I, no, I, I, but I, I, I truly, I just want to make sure that you know that that's really an important thing because it brings us back to the way that we operate at Sunshine House and why we do the things we do and. And like you say, it's just simple. It, it's just simple. it's just simple. You just you just do. <laughs> you just take yeah. what what people need, and you just okay. Well, what can we do to to make that happen? Yeah. But also being careful and considerate, and and just really caring and loving for one another is and and watchful. Watch and, and being watchful. I mean, I think about what you're doing now. You know doing very basic needs looking after very basic needs for people i think geez that's what that's what sunshine house has been doing for all this time and here you are doing it still as the most important thing that people you know meeting a very essential need you're still doing it i i so admirable it's so hard yeah again it's just one of those things. We know what the risks involved with it are, and we know we just got to just be smart and careful and then realize that if something shitty does happen here, that we have to be responsible to the people that yeah. we to deal with. Yeah. Well, we try our best, and mm. that's. I think that's the important lesson that we... That I think that's the only thing we have. <laughs> just try your best. <laughs> try yeah. your best and be, be generous. And find something to laugh at. All the time. Yeah. Even if it's so dark and grim. Oh, come on. <laughs> it's, that's the best.